Uh, I love your pastor, but then I think you already know that. <clears throat> you know, I was, um, I was uh, 14 years old when I felt um, moved, inspired is a little strong, but moved to read the Bible. And uh, so I started. The Bible to me was not an exciting book. It was a book that I'd grown up with. I was raised within a church structure. So I knew the Ten Commandments. I uh, memorized the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and knew all these creeds and, and, uh, and uh, went through the, the commandments of our, the, the denomination I was a part of and learned a little bit of history. And so, but as far as reading the Bible, not really, you know. And I would read it sometimes and go, oh my gosh, how can anybody stay awake while I read that, you know? But I begin to, I begin to read the Bible on purpose, meaning every night I would just sit down and read one chapter. And I would force myself. It was like a homework assignment to me, 14-year-old. And I would just open the Bible and I would read one chapter. I could barely make it through. And uh, I'd force myself to do it and then I'd go to bed and then I'd, you know, next day I'd do the same thing. A couple nights I'd come home and I'd be tired and I'd, you know, I'd get in bed and something would kind of, you didn't read a chapter. I know. I'll read two tomorrow night, you know. And uh, I didn't even realize it was the Lord dealing with me, speaking to me. But I could not go to sleep until I get up and read that chapter. So I get up and read the chapter. I did this for probably five to six months. And then one night while I was reading, I had a little lamp by a table. We had bunk beds in my room. My brother slept in the same room with me. I had that little night light, you know, and I would read that chapter and then slip into bed. And so I got up and was reading this chapter, and I read one chapter, and then I read another one. And then I wanted to see where the next one was going, so I read another one. And I remember, I don't remember what I was reading, but I remember at one point, I was in that little wooden chair by the little lamp, uh, with the lamp table, and I stood up and I said, yes! And it woke my brother up. And uh, he, was, he was on the top bunk, I was always on the bottom bunk. Because we were boys and he didn't want me to pee the bed and he'd get wet. So I had to sleep. He, had, he got the top bunk. So I was on the bottom bunk. And, and so I said, yes. And he woke up and hit his head on the ceiling. And he said, what are you doing? I said, Jamie, you will never believe what I just read. And he goes, I don't want to hear it. Shut the light off and go to bed. I said, no, you got to hear it. And I started preaching at him. And he told me to shut up. He had to get out of bed and shut me up and throw me in bed and turn the light off. Something had come undone in me. I don't know if you understand that the Bible is a dangerous book. It's a dangerous book to any anti-Christ spirit. And the reason it's a dangerous book is because it's filled with the life and love of Jesus Christ. It's a covenant book, which means it's filled with promise, promise that can't be broken. So when I think about how dangerous the Bible is, I think about how Islam fights the Bible and wants to hold the Quran up as the only divine book. And here's what they say about the Bible. They say, well, you can't trust the Bible because it's been corrupted by the Jews. And they corrupted it, and so it's not the word of God anymore because it's been corrupted. And then around the early 1950s, actually about 1947, they discovered what you might remember called the Dead Sea Scrolls. A little 11-year-old boy was out around the rocks, the rock fell down in a hole and he went down the cave, found these, you know, uh, canisters, clay canisters with, with paper in them. They were scrolls, pulled them out. He didn't know what they were. You know, they were written in, in, uh, in Hebrew, so he didn't know what they were. So he took them to a guy and he paid him five bucks for them scrolls the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they were found in a series of 11 caves, the whole book of Isaiah, parts of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Samuel, Ruth, Kings, Micah, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, Joel, Joshua, Judges, Proverbs, Numbers, Psalms, Ezekiel, Jonah, parts of these books, almost the whole book of Isaiah. They were dated to be over 2,000 years old. And you know what they were? The exact wording of your modern Bibles today. Well, there went the argument for corruption. And that calmed down Islam for a while. 
They were trying to always make the Bible of non-importance to people's life because it's just an old book, ancient writings that have been corrupted. It's no longer the Word of God. There is no book like the Bible in the world. 26 other divine, quote, writings called, you know, godly or God's words to people. None of them even touch the Bible. Not even close. Not in their geographical uh, specificity. Not in their predictive context of talking about the future and what would happen. None of them even come close to even talking about who God is. The Bible is different and unique. No divine book says God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. None. That's only found in the Bible. There is no other God who would ever even think about giving His Son for human life. In fact, he's, to be, he's demanded for you to worship Him. He demands for you to love Him, to do good works. But not one says that He loves you. There is no book like the Bible. Historians, archaeologists agree that the Dead Sea Scrolls were the most important find in the 20th century. Why would they say something like that? The most important find in the 20th century. When scholars worked to translate the scriptures to English so the common man could read them, they were burned at the stake for it. Why? Why would you, why would you be mad about the common man being able to just read the Bible? But they were burned at the stake. It was illegal to do it. According to governments, they said you can't translate the Bible into modern man English because the Bible proclaims liberty for the common man. And most governments didn't give liberty to people. They were monarchies ruled by kings. Because the Bible proclaimed liberty and freedom from tyrants and from evil kings and oppressive rulers and people in power did not want to lose that power. So keep the Bible out of the hands of common people. John Wyclef in the late 1300s was condemned as a heretic and had to flee for his life from the Catholic Church. Eighty copies he had made. They were meticulously copied and spread spread out among the people, but most of them were confiscated. I think only two actually remain. He said, we need to regard the Bible as the authority of God, not the Catholic Church. Because the Catholic Church sadly had gotten into bed with the government. And so they began to say, this is what the will of God is. They declared that it was the will of God for kings to have their children sit upon the throne and that kings had a divine right from God. It wasn't preached in the Bible. But how many of you know kings would like that doctrine? That they had a divine right. Pharaoh thought he was a god. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was a god. When you look at all the major empires of the world, they all declared themselves to be a divine god. But the Bible said there is no man who is god. And kings did not have a divine right to be a god. And, and so they didn't want the Bible printed to the common man because that might screw up their tyrannical reign. The Bible is a dangerous book. I was talking to a bunch of 16-year-olds. They said, they said My, we're not interested in politics. I said, okay, well, I'm going to go make a law that you can't get a license until you're 25. Well, that's not right. We should get them when we're 16. I said, that's politics. So if you're not interested, don't complain to me that you don't get a license until you're 25. The church often run from the idea of government because they said, well, the church shouldn't be involved in government. Your Bible is what brought independence to this nation. That's what brought independence to this nation. So it was a dangerous book. I was in Czechoslovakia years ago teaching at a Bible school, and there was a statue of a guy in the middle of the square. His name was Jan Hus, H-U-S. Never heard of him. He was burned at the stake. And why? Well, I wanted to find out. So I read it. I read because he challenged the Pope and the church declaring that the Bible should be the supreme authority and not the Catholic Church. That the Bible should be translated into the modern language of the people so that they could read it and see what God was saying to them. He was condemned as a heretic, burned at the stake. In the 1500s, a guy by the name of Tyndale, Bill, William, he printed the world's first English Bible. Every one of them were confiscated and burned because they said you cannot, it's illegal to translate the Bible into English or the common man's language 
lest he know what the Bible says for himself. Wow. Marx, Stalin, Hitler, all of them burned Bibles. Every one of them. They hated the Bible because the Bible told people what the will of God was for them to be free and to live in freedom and liberation. He said, here's what Marx said, we must rid the masses of religion and the Bible. Quote, because the Bible teaches that family is the will of God. A husband and wife, we must first corrupt the family and disintegrate it. Listen to the end of the quote. For people will never vote to give up their rights. <laughs> wow. He too burned Bibles and churches. He said, we must exploit the Bible to our advantage. So he did. He argued the Bible on public radio and, and, made, and mocked it to scholars. In 1539, the Anglican church, the head of the Anglican church under King Henry VIII contacted or contracted with Miles Coverdale to publish what was called the Great Bible. It was the first English Bible to be legally printed in Europe, England. But they wouldn't let the common man have it. They chained it to pulpits. It became known as the pulpit Bible. The common man couldn't read it. It could only be interpreted by the minister. Then when Henry's daughter, Mary, came to the throne, she didn't want the Bible to be the main authority. She wanted the church because she was embedded with the Catholic Church. So she killed a lot of people, Christians, ministers, who were preaching from the Bible and burned Bibles. Think about that. You might know her as Bloody Mary. That's where she got her term. When Hitler came to power, here's what he told preachers. You take care of your flocks, I'll take care of everything else. He even met with preachers. And he used the Bible to exploit his own purposes for his own evil. He believed in Darwin's theory. And he followed with passion the theories of Darwin calling upon all the nation of Germany to produce the Aryan race because that was the, the evolution of the perfect human being. And using Martin Luther, who had revolutionized all of Germany, fighting against the Catholic Church and breaking away with the nine, writing the 99 Thesis on the door of Gutenberg, where he set, where he set out the, 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 the truth of that we are saved by grace and not by works, he became one of the most influential men of all of Germany, and the Lutheran Church grew and flourished under his revelation of truth. But in Germany, Hitler called Luther, quote, a fighter against the Jewish spirit in the Christian church. He used Luther as a puppet who was already dead. He said, Dr. Luther is the greatest anti-Semite in all of German history, which wasn't true. Many banners were hung throughout Berlin before the days of World War II that encouraged Lutherans, Berlin Lutherans, to vote for pro-Nazi German Christians. And they would have a cross in a swastika called the hooked cross. And they would merge the two crosses together, Christ's cross with the hooked cross. And they would say, no Christian should be opposed to the German Aryan race. Wasn't biblical, but it was on a banner. And it worked. Hitler said, we must activate sports activities on Sundays because all families keep going to churches on Sundays and listening to the Bible being preached. We will never be able to do what we're doing if families are going to church. So activate as many sports activities as you can on Sundays and make sure there's plenty of candy to pass out to all the children who participate along with trophies for their participation. It matters not if they win or lose. Just get them trophies. <laughs> and so families quit going to church. And why? Well, because they wanted their kids to get candy and trophies and started going to sports activities on Sundays. Here's what he said. 
Our message must be louder than the Bible's. That's a quote from Adolf, who thought about going into ministry when he was an 11-year-old boy, whose father mocked him and made fun of him for wanting to be a weasel preacher. <laughs> Why is the Bible so dangerous? First of all, because it's the Word of God, right? It's the Word of God. Yet we leave it on our coffee tables and rarely open it. We're so used to it, we might have seven or eight of them in our home. I've got a bunch more than that of different translations. But what good is it if we never read it? Nobody more than hell itself wants to keep you out of God's Word because it will bring freedom to your life, freedom in every area of your life. So stay away from the Word of God. Second, because it's a covenant of promise between God. We ought to know this covenant better than any HOA we live in or better than the rules of our state, or better than the rules of our city. We ought to know what God says in His covenant promise to us. And without it, we lack knowing what the will of God is. And faith begins where the will of God is known. So without having God's Word in us, we find ourselves faithless or weak in faith or of a little faith because we're just not quite sure what the will of God is. There becomes our struggle. The founders of America saw that the Bible was so important that there was a request given to the Continental Congress to import 20,000 of them. When was this? 1777. They said, we need more Bibles in the land, more people to know what the Bible declares about liberty and freedom. Let the liberty bell ring. They said, we need to get more Bibles into America. So they paid for them. Remember now, the British policy at this time still banned English Bibles from being printed in American colonies. They could only be printed in England. So you couldn't print them in America. So they had to get them from England. So on September 11th, 1777, Congress voted to have the Committee on Commerce order 20,000 Bibles for 10,272 pounds. It's about $2 million today. What else was going on? Anybody remember? 1777? Well, Washington's army was fighting at Brandywine, where 1,200 heroic and gallant soldiers would die fighting for independence. Lafayette was bleeding badly, and it looked like he would be defeated. And there were booming canyon, cannons that could be heard in the halls of Philadelphia where the Continental Congress was ordering 20,000 Bibles, paying $2 million for them. They would soon be considered fugitives to the nation of Britain. And they would be hung from the gallows if found. And what were they doing? What was Congress doing at that time? They were passing a law to buy Bibles, to get into the hands of America so that Americans could know what God said about liberty and freedom. What is Congress trying to pass today? While our enemies are flooding our borders, both immigrants and enemies, over 250,000 people last month alone flooded into our nation. While babies are being murdered in hospitals and Planned Parent facilities, and abortions are happening on a daily basis while human trafficking is rising exponentially and children are being manipulated and sold for sex on multiple times a day under our noses. While suicide is raging among our young people and on our military personnel. What is Congress trying to pass today? Are they ordering more Bibles? Are they saying, you know what, we need to get more Bibles into the hands of Americans. We need to deal with our issues and problems. And if we don't know what God's Word says about all these issues, how are we ever going to be free as a nation? Now, I'll tell you what they're trying to pass. A $3.5 trillion budget that has nothing to do with the Bible, has nothing to do with the Word of God. And they want to, just as Marx and Stalin and Hitler, they want the voice of government to be louder than the Bible. They're not burning them yet. Yet, maybe, might be a key word. Yeah. Hmm. But they are trying to pass a budget. They finally got it passed, but it's not a 3.5 try. I think it's 1.2 that they just, the House passed it here a couple days ago. I've read a few things that are in it. I find it, to be honest, nonsense and the things that they're endeavoring to do. Some good things that are in it, but mostly 
just spending more money that they don't have. You know what most people believed in the early days of America? That debt was an enemy of the state. And that at the state, the government went into debt to serve its people, it would be a judgment of God. Where did they get that idea? Because the Bible said that to be in debt is to be enslaved. You become a servant to the lender. Who are we the greatest servant to? Well, the nation called C-H-I-N-A. That's where we borrowed a lot of our money from. And we borrowed a lot of money from other, other nations. And America is in such debt, I'm telling you, my friend, it's under judgment. Because you can't handle that kind of debt and have the blessings of God. So the early founders said, you know what Obadiah said and Nehemiah said and Ezra said? That God judges nations the way he judges individuals. But he doesn't judge nations in the afterlife because nations don't live in the afterlife. So their judgment must come to them in this life. So they feared that because of slavery, our nation would be judged. And preachers all over America spoke out against slavery. It was political. But they preached about it. Because they said, if we don't do something about the abuses that we do to our fellow man, God will judge our nation and will no longer be judged. And so they tried to get Bibles in the hands of the people. They would read them daily and say, come see what the Bible has to say about the abuses of human beings when we enslave them. It's against the Word of God. It's not just a political book, my friend. It's a covenant book of God's promise to you which makes it a government issue in the government of God. Remember the Bible said the government would be upon his shoulders? He is the king of kings and the lord of lords or noble of nobles, right? Just as Marx and Stalin and Hitler brought revolution and murdered millions of their own citizens and millions who opposed them by burning Bibles or closing churches and burning churches and making their voices louder than the Bible, then the Word of God, the same demonic spirit, the same antichrist spirit is at work among us today. As John said, there are many antichrists to shut the Bible out of people's lives. My friend, I, we ought to jump and shout and say, let's preach the Bible. Let's get it on TV. Let's get it on Facebook. Let's put it out in our service. Let's have services every day. Let's preach the Bible everywhere. Let's get people reading their Bibles. Let's let the Word of God come alive and be sharper than a two-edged sword and set people free from their addictions and their turmoil and their their chaos and their confusion and their illness and their sickness and let the word of God reign supreme in the life of our nation and the life of people. Oh God, forgive us for not preaching the Bible. Hallelujah. Because the Bible needs to be preached everywhere. Say it out loud. I'm going to read more of it. Uh, don't just say it to me. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to hold you accountable for it. Hallelujah. God's covenant of promise. How do you live in a world where confusion and chaos all around you seems like it's going crazy? Ask Enoch, he'll tell you, covenant. How do you prosper in a world of such lawless injustice and lying companies and unfairness? Well, ask Abraham, he'll tell you, covenant. How do you protect your family in a world of immorality and wickedness where there is seemingly no righteousness? Ask Noah. He'll tell you, covenant. This is how you live. The Bible is a book of covenants based on a legal means. That's what covenant means. You have cut a deal. And there are terms to that covenant. Whether it's Old or New Testament, it's a promise or will to perform on a legal basis. That's why you see so much bloodshed. You see it in the Old Testament. You see it in the New the blood of Jesus Christ. Because it's a legal means to hold to a promise. So everywhere when you read about the Bible, you'll read about covenant. Now, here's the best way to describe covenant in my mind. Covenant, its purpose is to three Ps. Provide, to protect, and to predict. That's the purpose of covenant. To provide, to protect, and to predict. Meaning... Provide means that you have all provision. This is peace, shalom. He is the God of peace. If you have full provision, you have full shalom. You have no anxiety, no worry, no fretfulness, no sense of fear. It has nothing to do with money, although 
it can mean material means, but it gives you a shalom. You have full provision. When you're in Israel today, they'll tell you, shalom. They'll say hello to you, shalom. They'll say goodbye to you, shalom. They say peace be upon you. I love that song, you know, may the, may the peace of Christ be upon you, the blessing song. It's to protect, protect you from want so that you never have want. Have you ever woken up a day and say, I don't want anything? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's to predict an outcome. God is very good at predicting outcomes. <laughs> He's very good at predicting outcomes. This is why we will our provisions to our family. It's to provide for them. It's to protect them. It's to predict what will happen to them. Because God's created us, He has willed His provision, His protection, His prediction into our life. He says, I'll be your provider, Jehovah Jireh, more than enough. I'll be your protection. I'm your defense. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. I'll be your future. Our future looks pretty bright with Christ, doesn't it? In His covenant, His will or His testament, He warns us of what can destroy it all. You eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, think about this as a covenant. I will bless you, make you fruitful, multiply, increase you, and you'll rule. You'll have subdue. You'll subdue things. So here's my covenant with you. One thing you mustn't do, you mustn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of blessing and calamity, good or evil, the King James uh, translates it. Not because that some great power is bigger than God, but because that it's opposite of God. God is life to go against His covenant is death. So if our trust is in God, then our trust is in something that brings us life. When we forfeit covenant, well, then we're forfeiting life, right? We're forfeiting life. Lord, life, love, Yahweh. Without Him, we experience death, fear, enslavement. The opposite of provision, the opposite of protection, the opposite of prediction. The Bible calls this calamity or curse. So when Adam and Eve sinned against God, it was called a curse. Everything was cursed. They, their lives were under a curse. The earth is under a curse. Everything becomes a curse. Do you know the word blessing and cursing is found in the Bible over 650 times? Because it's covenant language. So if you said to anybody, Christian or non-Christian, you want to be blessed or cursed? <laughs> what would people say? <laughs> oh, I'll be blessed. But they don't even know what it means. Except they assume it means good. And cursed is bad, right? I remember one time I was praying with a, someone in a healing line. It was a young person. And they had a, a massive growth on their uh, hand. And so I prayed for it. And after I'd prayed for it, I said, curse that in Jesus' name. I had no idea. He'd start swearing right there in the service, you know. <clears throat> I just, that wasn't my thought pattern, you know. <clears throat> but, but that's all he knew. So when you talk to people, say, would you rather be blessed or cursed? Well, I don't want to be sworn at. I want to be blessed. I want to be spoken a blessing to. Mankind becomes separated from God's blessing, from life, from love, from lordship. It changed their behavior. It changed their emotions. It changed their bodies. It changed the earth, everything on it. Death begins to rule over all the world. Death, fear, and bondage. People die. What, what they create withers and dies. It no longer thrives. It's no longer fruitful. It no longer produces. Relationships die. All living things die. Death itself brings confusion. Why did this happen? Why now? This is a bad time. How could this happen to me? All of life became confusion because of the curse. But a promise is a will to provide, a provision in the midst of the curse. It's a will to protect, to keep you and deliver you from the curse. It's a will to predict a future of blessing instead of the future of a curse. So God's covenants provide, predict, and protect. God predicts your future. Your future with Him, which is probably the most fascinating and revealing truth about your covenant with God. You're in here. 
You're in here. You're called a new creation. You're called a son or daughter of God. You're called an heir of Jesus Christ. Your identity is found in here. It's not found in your sexuality. But keep that out of government because we don't know what the Bible says about identity. We want to figure that out on ourselves. So we'll figure it out by our skin color or figure it out by our sexual desire or, or, or whatever we're thinking at the time. And we're just going to locate our identity with that. It's no wonder we're, we're confused in our nation. Anymore. We can't even figure out who we are. And no wonder they don't want the Bible preached in our schools. Don't tell your kids that they're God's creation. Don't tell them that they'll be accountable to God. Don't tell them that the Ten Commandments are really a good thing for them, not a bad thing. Let's just remove all of God out of our schools because we want the voice of government to be louder than the Bible. Hmm? Oh, I'm preaching to the choir, but somebody give me an amen. amen. Which is probably the most fascinating revealing truth about the Bible is its predictive nature. One third of all the Bible is predictive, prophetic talking about in both covenants, both old and new, what will happen in the future in people's lives. This happened in families. This happened in nations. It happened in individuals, dealing with both empires, their rise, their fall, dealing with God's truth about your personal life and what would happen to it. He wants to redeem you from the curse. He wants to deal with your future and eternity and what will happen. For God wills to provide. He wills to protect. He wills to predict. He wills to predict your restoration because it's a legal promise called covenant, which means that you're going to see a lot of things in the Bible, things that you won't understand. Like, why does the Bible say so often God is faithful? Why so often are there scriptures that says God is true? Because if a promise is not made by someone is true, then what good is the promise? If the promise is made by someone who's not faithful, then what good is the promise? So you'll see like this, the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful and true in all he does. Psalm 33, 4. Deuteronomy 7, 9. The faithful God who will keep his covenant. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. The Lord is faithful and will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Psalm 89, 8. O Lord God who is mighty as you, no one for you have faithfulness all around you. Hebrews 11:11. 11, 11, By faith, Sarah received power to conceive even when past childbearing age for she considered him faithful who had promised her. Lamentations 3.23, your mercies are new every morning for great is your faithfulness. No wonder Deuteronomy 32.4 says he's the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are just for he is faithful. Why all these scriptures? Because he's a covenant God and he won't break his word. His word is unbreakable. The scripture cannot be broken because he is faithful. He is without sin. He's just. He's upright. Isaiah 25, 1. You are my God and I will exalt you and praise your name for you do marvelous things, plans from of old because you are faithful and true. A covenant. It's a promise. Hallelujah. My steps are ordered of the Lord. So I ain't afraid to take the next step. I'm not afraid of tomorrow. I'm not afraid of next week. I'm not afraid of next year. I'm not afraid of what's going to happen to ministry. I'm not afraid of what's going to happen to my job. I'm not afraid of what's going to happen in the world. And why? Because the Lord is faithful and true. And so I have a covenant with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Blood was shed for me on purpose to make a legal covenant so that the faithful, true, just God would predict my life, would provide for my life, would protect my life in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't let me go in here. Hallelujah. A covenant then is a promise or a testament that's willed by God, that God is sure and faithful in His will to deliver you from any sin, from any death, to redeem you from its dominion and its effects over you because sin and death enslaves you. It wants to rule you. It wants to lord over you. It wants to put you in its rulership or in bondage to it. The bondage of fear. Do you know America is the most drug-induced nation in all the world? More money is spent out of America and more people per capita than any other nation on earth is drugged like America. Over 67% of people in America are on some anxiety for fear. 
excuse me, some pill for anxiety and fear. They can't sleep, they can't function, they can't operate, they struggle with their emotions, their feelings. That means some of you in here tonight probably struggle with this very issue and you're looking for help. Somebody's got to help me, so I go to the doctor to get some sort of medication because the anxiety overwhelms me, the fear that I can't deal with. Can somebody help me? We're not looking to God anymore. We're looking to pharmaceuticals. We're looking to government for its help. We're looking to the one who says, don't pay attention to God who is faithful and true. Pay attention to us and we will keep you safe and we will protect you and we will guard you. Blah, blah, blah. It puts you in bondage. The bondage of anxiety and depression. I just met with a woman the other day, the other day, a couple months back. Everything's the other day. <laughs> and, uh, and I was meeting with her, and she came to meet with me, and she said, I have such anxiety, Pastor. I said, are you on meds? Yes. I said, what meds are you taking? She told me. I'm like, wow, those are strong. She goes, I know. She goes, and every day when, you know, when I'm here, when she comes to church, she says, I want to stand up in the, in the pew, in the chair. I want to stand up in the chair and say, he's a liar. And she goes, I know you're not a liar. I, I know that you're teaching God's word, but something in me just wants to stand up and say, none of it's true. He's lying. I said, oh. I said, I know what that is. She said, you do? I said, yeah. She said, you can help me? I said, no problem. She says, oh, good, because I was afraid that sooner or later I'm going to stand up in the sanctuary and call you a liar. I said, don't worry about it. I'm going to cast the devil out of you right now. She says, I have a devil. I said, yeah, that devil's just coming on your life. He's trying to oppress you with fear and anxiety and wanting to call me a liar, which is just nothing more than preaching the word. So I'm going to cast the devil out of you. She goes, will it hurt? I said, no, it'll set you free. And I started praying in tongues right over in the name of Jesus. When I started praying in tongues, she went stiff like a board. It was like she, you know, had a seizure. She just went stiff like a board. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. You know, she flew back and her, she had sandals on and they flew up in the air, you know, and, and her Barrette in her hair and it flew off the back, you know, and, and so, you know, it was just kind of, a, you know, a weird moment. And then, and then, you know, as soon as that was over, you know, I said, there, now you're free in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and worship God. And she looked at me and she kind of shook her head like, you know, somebody just throwing a bunch of water on her. And she goes, what just happened here? I said, you got free from anxiety. You got free from fear. You got free from the demons that are trying to control you. You don't need your meds anymore. All you need to stand up and worship the Lord God of heaven and earth who is faithful and true. And she stood up to her feet and she said, oh, thank you, Jesus, and cried. And then she hugged me and she went away and she quit taking all of her medicine because she's not afraid anymore and she sleeps like a baby and she's just free from anxiety. I thought, what a joy of the Lord to be free from the bondage of fear that you don't have to live with all that kind of bondage in your life and live in all that costly medicine just because you're afraid. And afraid of what? There's lots of things to fear, right? No wonder the Lord said, do not fear. Wow. The confusion of emotions drives behaviors of self-destructive, self-addictive, self-contained. It's a curse. Fear is not your friend. Anxiety is not a warm blanket of comfort. It's an enemy to your soul. Depression is not liberating. The emotional feelings of mental illness are a jailhouse to the people who are in them. They're a prison to the people who's living their lives in them. They drive their behaviors and they are never life-giving. They never bring restoration. They never bring help. They are trapped by these feelings of insecurity that I don't fit in, that I am not loved, that I am not wanted, that somehow I'm a failure, that I am rejected, that I have little value. And they're all lives of hell. They want the voice of hell to be stronger than the word of the living God that has life-giving power to set you free. No wonder the Bible said in Jesus, said in John 10, 10, I'm come to give you life, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Whether it's banners in Berlin or it's of social media on your phone, it wants to be a louder voice than God. And wouldn't to God that we would spend our time first seeing what the word of the Lord said instead of seeing what somebody posted on social media. And I'm not against social media. It can be used for good communication, but most of it is heart-wrenching. It takes up people's time. It steals their efforts. It steals their creative ability because they're so busy watching other people live life instead of living their own. Oh, that's good preaching money. Just keep right on with it. Hallelujah. All right. I'm going I'm to go further. 
No wonder the Bible says he delivers me from all my fears. He takes away my shame. He saves me out of all my troubles. He encamps around those who trust them and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good for there is no want to those who trust in him. This is God's provision of promise to provide, to protect, and to predict your future with blessing. Amen? God's covenant of provision to provide, Deuteronomy 8.18, is both a predictive scripture and a warning, reminder of God's promise to provide. You shall remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he has sworn to your fathers. God wills and promises to provide by giving you power to get wealth. The curse cannot overpower you. Years ago, I'll give you just a simple explanation. You know, I'm a minister. I've been in ministry since I'm 18 years old, but my mother wants me to come and cut her grass. I'm like, Mom, I can't come out and cut your grass. It's a five-acre plot of land. It's going to take me, you know, a day. It's not like I have time. Maybe I can get it scheduled, you know. And she goes, I'll pay you. And I said, I'm not trying to get paid, Mom. I don't want you to pay me. I'd come mow your grass for free, but I'm not going to come mow it because I'm busy in ministry, you know. <laughs> I'm believing God for provision. And another guy calls me up and he says, hey, I was wanting to know if you could come down and, you know, uh, speak to my youth, you know, group down here. I said, well, I, when, when are you wanting me to come? He said, well, I'd like you to come. I said, well, I can't come that weekend. I said, uh, but maybe I can come the next weekend. He goes, well, there's just three of them, you know. And I said, oh, only three of them. I said, well, I said, do you need me to come and speak to three of them? He goes, well, he said, maybe if you came, we could get five of them because we got five total in our church and I'd like you to come. I said, well, I don't know if I'll have time to come down, but I'll see if I can do that, you know. So I got a phone with him. Then uh, uh, the Lord dealt with me and said, you know, I'm trying to bless you. I'm trying to provide for you. I'm trying to give you power to get wealth. But you won't go mow your mother's grass and she's willing to pay you for it. I said, but Lord, I'm doing ministry. He said, isn't that ministry? Serving your parent, honoring her? <laughs> Don't talk the Bible to me, Lord. I didn't need that. <clears throat> so I called my mom. I said, Mom, I'll come mow your grass. She pays me $75 to mow her grass. $75 I didn't have. Then I went down and preached for the Methodist minister down in um, Shelby at his church. And there was four kids that showed up. And uh, he said, you know, thanks for coming. He said, I just wanted to give you a little gas money for helping me out. I said, yeah, thanks, appreciate that. So he gave me an envelope, and I went home, opened it up. <laughs> that guy had paid me $600. It, you know, it didn't take $600. It might today to drive from Harlem to Shelby. <laughs> but it didn't take $600. That was a lot of money for gas, you know what I'm saying? Thank God. And I said, Lord, forgive me. You were trying to give me power to get wealth while I was too busy doing ministry. He's a covenant God. The Bible tells us that when we seek after riches or love riches more than God, that it's wicked or evil. Well, I don't want to hear that, right? It's not his covenant of provision for us to be greedy. For example, he tells us that Satan and Lucifer loved his provision, the merchandise, the multitude of his merchandise, more than he loved God. God has never willed or lacked. He never has willed poverty. He's never favored some and not others. He's never favored some and ignored others. He's only kept his promise to those who trust him. Say it out loud. I'm a truster. I'm a truster in God's provision. The Antichrist always lusts for power and the control of riches, monetary increase. This is why when the Antichrist does come to try to set up his rule, he'll quickly set an agenda to control all commerce through a mark called the mark of the beast that will create an inability for us to buy or sell without that mark. What's he trying to do? To create the control of commerce, greed. And every tyrant and ruler who's tried to rule the world has done the same. They just didn't have the technology to do it. But today the technology exists, which means we must be closer to getting caught away with the Lord Jesus Christ than ever before. In fact, I'm kind of walking around town now, just jumping up and down once in a while. And people will say, Monty, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm just practicing. What are you practicing for? I'm practicing leaving you here because I'm going to be gone in the rapture. If you'd like to go with me, let me tell you about Jesus. 
Right? That's a good little intro. You know, they think you're crazy, but they will listen to you because you're just crazy enough. They want to know what you're talking about. Hallelujah. So I dare you to go to work tomorrow and just jump up and down a couple of times and let people see if they ask you a question. Now, if they don't, don't worry about it. Just jump up and down a few times. You don't have to jump and down the whole time you're there. But just as a practice for rapture, it won't do you any good because you're going to go faster than you can jump. Right? So you'll be gone in the twinkling in the moment of an eye, but you can tell somebody, I want you to go with me. Peggy did this. She worked on a line in a factory when she was like 19 years old, and she would preach to everybody on the line because they're all sitting there having to do their little parts with the, with the refrigerator, and she'd preach them about Jesus. She said, I don't want you to be left here. If you don't get saved, I'm going to be gone, and you'll be stuck here, and you'll wonder where I went, and you won't get to go where I got because I'll be with Jesus, and you're going to be under the tyrant of the Antichrist and the sorrow of the world. The Bible said it'll be such sorrow if God didn't shorten it up that nobody would survive it. Peggy said, I don't want you to be lost here. So people on her line kept getting saved. So she would request to get moved in her line to somewhere else because she'd get them saved around her and there's nobody else to get saved. So she would go to a different line and then she'd preach to them until then they get saved. And then she'd say, can you find me another line? They'd say, Peggy, we can't keep having you preach to people on the line. We can't keep moving you around. We got you here to make refrigerator parts. She says, well, I'm here to preach the gospel. And so she just kept jumping up and down is what she was doing, getting as many people to say. Are you and I not getting as many people saved as possible? Because Jesus Christ is coming back. His covenant has made promise to you. He is faithful, just, and true. He will come. He will judge the living and the dead. He will judge the world, the nations that are before him. He will be the King of kings and Lord of lords. It ought to be in our mind every day. Is there somebody that I know that doesn't know Jesus Christ yet? And shouldn't I be doing something about that? Nudge your neighbor and say, get busy, would you? It's a demonic plan for people to not know the gospel of salvation. It's a man's way of provision and protection and predicting. It's man's will to be his own God. This is why I'm telling you, it's, I know it's controversial, but all the things that are happening today with mandates, masking, and jab shots, and, and vaccinations, and all this stuff, it's not about your health. It's not about your protection. I know it's being sold that way. I know you're being told this will protect you. I know you're being told this is for your good. This is for your health. That's not what this is about. This is about a sense of control. It's an antichrist spirit that wants to run over people. Now, some might do it in the name of health. They're like, no, we believe in this and this is what's good, but we want to run over your personal rights and go away from what God said about being your healer and provider because government can protect you better than God. So trust in the vaccination and don't trust in God. I'm not mad at you if you get vaccinated. I'm not happy for you if you don't get vaccinated. All I'm saying is don't trust in government's ability to keep you safe, to protect you, to provide for you and to be your predictor of your future. There's someone else who's already done that, who's faithful and true, who is just, and who will never let you down in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I'm all over the place. I, I don't even know where I'm going to this. But praise the God. But, but I, can, I can sense that the Lord uh, is doing good things in you while I'm speaking. And it's not because of what I'm speaking, but because of the Spirit of the Lord is saying. He's saying. And He's saying to you, I am your provider. I am your healer. I'm your provider. I'm your predictor. I'm the one who knows your future better than your past. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I speak predictively to you tonight that you are safe that you are safe by the name of the Lord because you have a covenant with Him. That you are not in fear because of what is going on around you and what you're being told to do for your safety. The name of the Lord is your strong tower. There's where you need to run into. There is your safety. He is the rock that cannot be moved. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I bind the spirit of fear that wants to control your life from following Christ and trusting in His promise, His covenant. I bind it under the authority of the blood of Jesus Christ that you will step away from it and say, I'm not living under this dominion. 
I'm not living under this oppression. I am not living under the fear of what tomorrow may bring. I'm not living under the fear of what governments may do or what jobs or companies may do. I'm not living under fear of what the medical community may do. I'm not going to live that way. I'm not going to constantly live with anxiety and fear by letting their voice be louder, by letting their banners be over my mind. In the name of Jesus Christ, I'm setting the banner of the Lord over me. I'm wrapping myself in his banner, the Lord our victory, the Lord our banner. Jehovah Nisi, he's the one that I'm putting my trust in. And I bind this spirit of fear in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Glory to God. Now, I want to pray over you specifically. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Because I know this is personal for people and I have no intention of of making you sense a sense of embarrassment or any kind of uh, anxiety because of how I'm going to pray for you. Many of you have faced so much fear in your life, you're, you're, you're finding yourself confused. You're not even sure of what your future is going to bring. You're a Christian, you know the Lord, but you're struggling to find faith and trust in God because of the banners that are being lifted over your life. And you want to stay informed and you want to stay on top of things. And so you're listening to a lot of different voices, but most of those voices are not proclaiming the word of the Lord to you. Instead, they're proclaiming a trust in something else besides God. And tonight, I want to speak over you and pray over you. And I'm asking you to just to be honest with yourself, to be honest with God and say, Pastor, I need that prayer. I need your your involvement in my world tonight in the name of Jesus. I want to be free from this. I want to put my trust in a covenant God, not in government or not in medical science or not in a company that provides an income for me or a business that is providing it. I want to put my trust wholly in the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you're here tonight, you say, boy, that's me. Then I want to pray specifically over you. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front in some kind of an altar call, which is a good thing, but that's not what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pray for you right where you sit. But you'd say, Pastor, I want you to pray that over me. Would you just slip up your hand and say, include me in that prayer, lift it up high, be, be actually bold about it. Yeah, good, very good. Because the, when you get bold about it, that's how it breaks off you. Praise God in the name of Jesus. Thank you, thank you, good. All right, you can put your hands down. Now here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Look at me for a second, because here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you in a moment to lift both hands towards heaven. You know, the Bible says lift holy hands in the sanctuary. So we're going to do that in a moment. And I'm going to ask you to do that because there's something about, you know, in, in, in our culture, there's something about lifting hands that says, I surrender. Right? Stick them up, you know, you know, or the police, put your hands where I can see them. You know, it, it, there's something about it. it's a surrender, isn't it? So I'm going to ask you to lift it. In the Bible, you know what they did with their hands? They lifted them up to wave an offering before God. They lifted it up with an offering. It was an animal. And they would lift that slain animal whose blood had been shed, and then they would wave it before heaven to see that blood had been shed for them. And it was their offering to God. The Bible said we bring a sacrifice of praise, lifting up holy hands without anger and without doubt. Our hands are empty because the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed for us. It's not some goat or an animal. So we're going to wave our hands before God in the freedom of that sacrifice. Now, if you raise your hand to be prayed for, I'm going to do that. But let's everybody do it. Let's just everybody lift our hands before the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. And I want you to wave them and say, Jesus, say it out loud, Jesus, you're my sacrifice. I wave my hands before you, knowing that you have covered me from anything that can harm me, hurt me, or put me in bondage. I am free from oppression and fear shall not come nigh me for there is no oppression where the blood of Jesus has set me free. Thank you, Lord. I am free, 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 free. The Lord has made me free in Jesus name. Hallelujah. Oh, it's a simple way of ministry, but now give the Lord a big hand of applause. Just let him know you're thankful for it in Jesus' name.
It's just a way to, it's a method of just uh, a yielding to the Lord. You know, the Bible has lots of things to say about that in our worship. We can kneel before Him. We can lay before Him prostrate. These are all bodily functions that we can do to place a symbol of our worship before the Lord. So it is with hands being lifted up. It has huge symbolism in what we're doing. And symbolism is powerful. Do you ever think about when, um, when we went into Iraq and, and uh, took down Saddam Hussein? The first thing they did was tear down all of his statues. They tore down all the symbolism that said, this is the one who rules over us. They tore it down. Same thing in Russia. When communism fell, you know what they went? They tore down all the statues of Stalin. All those statues that said, I'm the, I'm the ruler of Russia. You weren't allowed to hang crosses in your home. You could have a statue or a picture of Stalin. Symbolism. And they threw him out. They burned the pictures of Stalin. They tore down his statues. That's what you did tonight when you raised your hands. Yeah. It was symbolism. You were tearing down any image, any statue of fear that's trying to rule you. You pushed it over in the name of Jesus and set Jesus Christ as the image bearer of your heart. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now, one last thing before I, I turn it back to your pastor. Someone broke their neck. And it's not that it's put you in danger of death, but you had your neck broken. I sense that this was an injury that happened not just recently, but some time ago. But your neck was broken. Who is that? I want to pray over you and bring healing to your neck in the name of Jesus. You broke your neck. You broke your neck? Or you're pointing to him? You broke your neck too. It could be more than... What happened to you? A semi-door. A semi-door. What happened to you? Wow. You, you still having problems from it? Yeah. Well, I would think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to pray over you in the name of Jesus Christ. Is that all right? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to touch you. The Bible says lay hands on the sick, so I'm going to do that in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray over this neck that was broken, and I command complete restoration and healing in it because you're a covenant God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I thank you for healing and restoring his neck to full movement. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I release that power into him now. And thank you, Father, for this miracle in his neck in Jesus' name. I think you can move that around a little bit and see that it's, it's already better. Can you tell? It's different, isn't it? Yes. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I, I speak over this neck in the name of Jesus Christ that was broken, and I thank you for your restoration and healing in it. I release the power of God into him now to make it whole and well, all vertebrae, all muscle tissue. I thank you for restoring it in the name of Jesus Christ and being whole in Jesus' name. Thank you, God, for this miracle. I'm moving it around on purpose in the name of Jesus Christ, letting the work of God do his thing. Move that around as much as you can and notice the difference. What's changed already? It's not as stiff as it was. It's not as stiff as it was. I my torn rotator cuff. He healed that last night too. <laughs> he says, I believe he healed my rotator cuff last night. Well, you're getting a regular overhaul. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Come on, let's welcome back Pastor Mike. Thank you for just paying attention for a moment. Thanks, Pastor. Glory to God. Isn't that good? God's so good. I'll tell you what, there was some rich stuff in there, wasn't there? And it just goes to show us once again how important the Bible, the Word of God, to get in the book and let the book get in us. Because it changes the way we live, the way we think, the what we believe, and it's powerful. Now, one of the things that I just want to exhort you in, you know, I mean, this was so made alive to me because, you know, one of the things that's important is... Uh, the Bible says to not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And when you, when you understand His will, it, it postures or, or positions you differently than people that don't know what His will is. And, and what it also does is it emboldens your heart and your mind and things to stand. And one of the things that Pastor Money was talking about here this evening uh, when he was, he was standing right here, and I don't know, remember exactly how he put it, but the essence of it was, I am not going to live like this. I am not 
going to live under fear anymore. Are you listening to me? And, and I think the, the subtle mistake that people often uh, make is they don't realize how much they have a part to play in getting delivered. I mean, just by simply by your own will, where you just say, you know what, enough of this, I am not going to do this. Because what we see happening in the world today is to take that power away from you. Your own, you call it willpower, but, and that's exactly what it is. But you know, the people that do know their God, the Bible says shall be what? Strong and do exploits, praise God. And so I want to share this verse of scripture with you to close, just to seed you with this idea. You know, the psalmist of old, this is Psalm 18, or 118. He said, I called upon the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. And this is a verse that I want you to get. He said, the psalmist said, the Lord is on my side. And then he said, I will not fear. And you know what, my friends, that needs to be your confession, your belief, your, your conviction. If you want, I will not fear because people are being controlled and driven by it unnecessarily. And so it's so important for you, child of God, to get a hold of that because there's a lot of stuff that's going on in people's lives that are, it's so unnecessary. You would not have to, you know, deal with it. But you have a right, you have a will, you have a covenant, praise God as a child of his, not to tolerate it anymore. So praise God once you let, just let her happen, amen? Praise God. You know, if my wife, you know, if we had a sliding glass door in the house and she had the door open, the screen was open, all of a sudden, you know, there's a coon or maybe a family of them. God only knows, you know, they usually run on packs, you know, and the, and the things come in the house. I mean, you're not, you're not going to stand there and go, oh, what are we going to do now? Look at there. They're all over there and they're tearing stuff up and they're looking at our covers. No, dude, you'd get after it. Huh? Wouldn't you? I, I like to think you would anyway, you know, say, no, this is unacceptable. Get out of my house. So when it comes to fear, you can say, get out of my life not having it anymore, hallelujah. And then do exactly what he um, um, told you to do, you know. I mean, one of the most powerful things you can do is lift up your holy hands and begin to praise God because it stills the enemy in the venture. People think it's, it's nonsense or foolish or whatever the case might be, but dude, it sets the power of God into motion in your life when you do it. Well, I could preach for a long time too. Could you preach for a long time too? You're so kind. Shut, us, shut it off, didn't you? Glory to God. Amen. Well, anyway, it's been rich and wonderful. I trust that you've been blessed. Take the things that you've heard. You can always watch uh, these things on podcast again and let them get down on the inside of you. Learn and grow and develop. And better start reading a chapter every night, huh? Okay. Hallelujah. Probably get blessed out of the deal. All right. Let's everybody stand up. Thank you again so much, you guys, for coming, being a part of the service here to, tonight. I know that you are blessed by the Word of God and the ministry of His Word. And so tomorrow night will be the finale. Uh, Marty will be with us. It'll be a good word, I'm sure, that he'll bring to, to be a blessing to you. So turn around, shake hands with two or three people. Let them know again you're glad they came and you can be dismissed.